Grounding Dyno, the latest state-of-the-art zero-shot object detector. I know that's a mouthful, but trust me, it is crazy. With regular object detectors, you are pretty much bound to predefined list of classes, and if you wish to expand that list, you need to gather more data, annotate it, retrain the model, that's a lot of work. With Grounding Dyno, pretty much all you need to do is change your prompt, and in most of the cases, it will successfully find any arbitrary object that you would like to detect. I tested it on a few images, looking for weird objects like knees or dog tails, and it performed really well. So without further ado, let's jump into the code. This demo will be a bit different because I will not show you how to train the model. However, we'll go through multiple inference examples and I will show you what did I learned along the way. And spoiler alert, this is the most fun I had with any computer vision model by far since I remember. Hi, it's Peter from the future. I'm just producing the video and I decided I need to correct that statement. Obviously, when we talk about computer vision in general, I had a lot of fun with models like Stable Diffusion. But when we talk about object detectors specifically, I stand by my original statement. This is the most fun I had. Okay, back to the video. Okay, let's get our hands dirty. As usual, we created a Jupyter Notebook that you can use along the way in that tutorial. So we scroll a little bit lower and open zero shot object detection with grounding dyno. Uh, let me just increase the size of the window a bit so you would have easier time following the tutorial. And we are pretty much good to go. As usual, the first thing that we are going to do is to execute NVIDIA SMI just to confirm that we have access to the GPU. In the meantime, Google has asked us whether or not we want to run that notebook because it's not created by Google. Of course it's not because it's created by me. Everything runs properly. We have the usual NVIDIA SMI output. So now we can proceed to create the home constant. We will use it to manage the paths to models, weights, configuration files, and the rest of the data. And the next thing is to install Grounding Dyno. It is not distributed via pip just yet. So for now, you need to clone the repository, enter the directory, and install all the dependencies. And uh, spoiler alert, at the very end of that cell, you see that I install Roboflow. And that's because at the very end of that video, I will show you how to use Grounding Dyno and Roboflow to automatically annotate your dataset. Most of those dependencies are already installed uh, in Google Colab, but keep in mind that if you run that installation process on your machine, that may take a little bit of time. Cool, so far so good. We are done with the installation and now we can prepare to load the model into the memory. So when we load the model, it takes two parameters. The first one is the path to configuration file. The second one is the path to weights file. The first one comes with the repository. The second one needs to be downloaded. So that's what we do. The download shouldn't take too much time because that file is pretty small. And at the very end, we just create a constant leading to the grounding dyno weights and confirm that the file has downloaded properly. Now, to be able to play a little bit with the model during the demo, I prepared a small set of images. Uh, so we will just W get them. And after the download will be completed, you will find them in the data directory. Those are just coming from my private album, myself and my doc. But obviously feel free to upload your own images. I'm actually super curious how the model will do with different examples. Okay, and now we can finally load the model into the memory. Like I said, the function takes only two parameters, config file and the weights file. It loads a little bit more of weights uh, from the internet in the meantime, I believe for the backbone. And when that is done, we can finally have some fun. Now we can scroll a little bit lower and start our journey with the first example. And I guess that's the perfect moment to talk about multimodality. It is really hot topic right now because upcoming GPT-4 model will be multimodal and that means that it will be able to take image and prompt 
as an input, and it's exactly the same in the case of grounding dyno. And that's how it's different from the regular object detection models, where you usually only pass an image and get a list of bounding boxes that match the pre-selected class list. Over here, you pass an image and the prompt, and you get the list of bounding boxes that fulfill that prompt. And it's super cool because if you want to detect something new on the image, you don't need to retrain the model you just change the prompt. So now let's go back to our first example. Uh, I selected doc free JPEG image uh, as the first one. We can see the raw image right now on the right side and we will use a simple chair query. My intent here is to detect all the chairs visible on the scene. You can also see that there are two additional uh, hyperparameters, box threshold and text threshold. They are here to improve the quality of your predictions. I will not use them in this demo, but obviously feel free to experiment, try different value, let us know in the comments what you found. Okay, enough of the talking. Let's run the first query and take a look at the results. And we can see, maybe uh, let me just make the whole image a bit smaller so we would be able to see it all at once. We see that the model was capable of detecting all the chairs visible on the scene. Okay, but you might say detecting chairs is cool, but it's also not super impressive. After all, chair class is part of Coco data set and pretty much any pre-trained YOLO detector would be able to do the same. And you would be right. But Grounding Dino has a lot more capabilities. So let me show you what we can do with just a little bit of prompt engineering. So now let's run our model on the same image, but let's modify the prompt a bit. So this time I will look only for chair with men sitting on it. And now when we run the model, we can see that we have two detections. The first one is men, and the second one is the only chair on the scene that is occupied by a person. And that's pretty crazy if you ask me because it allows you to create advanced constraints that previously would be only possible by writing a ton of Python code. You know, detect chair and detect person and if the IOU of the chair and the person detection is high enough over some threshold, then filter out all other chairs and keep only those with high IOU. How much simpler is just to write, give me chairs with men sitting on it. Okay, so now what I want to show you is that we can detect multiple classes at the same time. So not only I uh, detect chair, but I also decided to put dog, table, uh, shoe, light bulb, like basically anything that I saw on the scene uh, and try to detect all of those objects at the same time. If I want to do that, I just need to put the name of the classes and separate them with the commas and that should be fine. So let's take a look at the result. And it turned out like really well, in my opinion. Sure, most of those classes are still coming from Coco Dataset, but there are uh, some classes like tail or light bulb that are not part of the Coco Dataset, but still were detected uh, just as well. Okay, so let's try to go even more crazy and add even more classes. So I don't know, path, finger, and I, for example, and when we take a look at the result, we see that it detected I and the pa, but only one, and no finger. Okay, so you get the idea. You can detect a lot of stuff, and the objects that you want to detect don't necessarily need to come from the Coco data set, so you can get creative. I had a lot of fun just looking for different objects on the scene. And the additional benefit is that you can use language to create additional constraints to detect specific objects on the scene. And we will see one more example of that right now. Okay, so let's take a look at another image, this time uh, dog-2 JPEG, and that image was done in restaurant, so you can see a lot of glasses on the table. So let's write a simple query to detect all the glasses on the table, and we can see that it done a pretty good job. It accidentally classified a salt container as glass, but it's it's okay, given the fact that it's transparent uh, and most likely made out of glass. But now let's modify the query and look for the glass that is most to the right 
And sure enough, the model is capable of detecting that particular glass. I mean, like, it blows my mind that stuff like that is possible. And once again, it's it's not about the fact that it's technically possible, because I could do that with YOLO. I would just run the detection of glasses and grab the bounding box most to the right on the frame. It's just the fact that using language to create that query is significantly easier to do. Okay, so enough of the examples using my images. You will find even more of them uh, in the actual notebook, but I don't want you to be bored to death uh, during that video. So let's move on and try to combine the power of RoboFlow datasets with uh, grounding dyno detection capabilities. For me, the biggest use case for a model like that is actually automated dataset annotation. Obviously, um, that wouldn't work for every data set because sometimes uh, the set of classes that you are looking for is so obscure that even such a powerful zero-shot detector like Grounding Dyno will not be able uh, to deliver. However, I think that it's always worth to try because you may be the lucky person and spend like 50% less time annotating bounding boxes in your project. And all you need to do is write a small text query to do that. Okay, so we are back in Notebook and right now we will pull the data set from RoboFlow Universe. So the first thing that I need to do is log in into RoboFlow. So we have a new CLI to do that. I select the workspace that I want to use to generate the token. In my case, I will keep the default one. Now the token is generated, I can copy it, paste it in the input field, press shift enter so that it would be hidden. And yeah, we are pretty much authenticated. Now to make our life a little bit easier, I created a small utility that uh, is here to pick the random image from the data set. And now the only thing that is left to do is to download the data set. I decided to go for the data set from RoboFlow Universe. Uh, this one contains pictures of workers, so people in uh, reflective vests and helmets. I decided it will be pretty cool use case for us. The next thing right after the data set uh, is going to be downloaded is to create the text prompt. And I decided to uh, take the default route and just concat uh, every class name from that particular project and separate those names with commas. And it turned out that that was not the best choice. Uh, we can clearly see that the person uh, have both helmet and reflective vest uh, on him. Uh, but the model only detected the helmet. And this happened because the class names in the project uh, were not very specific. They used abbreviations and a lot of assumptions, like instead of calling the class reflective vest, it was only reflective. Uh, and because of that, the model had a really hard time to understand what do we want to detect. So let's go back to Jupyter Notebook and manually refine the list of classes. I will go for reflective safety vest, helmet, hat, and non-reflective safety vest. And sure enough, after just a little bit of prompt engineering, the model is capable of detecting much more on the image. And that's all for today. Uh, I hope that you noticed that I had a ton of fun playing with that model. I really think that architectures like this are the future of computer vision. Uh, many people speculate that GPT-4 will have similar capabilities. We actually have a video um, when we also do a little bit of speculation. I will include that video in the description. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. And stay tuned for more computer vision coming to this channel soon. My name is Peter and I see you next time. Bye.